Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to Chariot Solutions Spa Day. Hope everybody's ready for some nice, relaxing, single page application soaking in. Uh, my name is, I swear I have one, <laughs> Pete Fleming. Um, I am head of user experience and design at Chariot Solutions. Uh, today we're going to cover a few of the uh, foundational principles of user experience. Um, now these principles aren't specific to JavaScript. Um, they're, they're really sort of pertain to any uh, language as uh, whenever you're doing um, programming for user interfaces. Um, but, they, but they definitely do uh, pertain here. So before we jump in and get too far, um, show of hands, how many people here uh, in your organization do you wear the hat either partially or fully of a designer or you're responsible for the user experience? Is anybody partially or wholly responsible for user experience? If it's kind of a maybe, then you're definitely part of it. <laughs> All right, so that's good. So uh, here's a bunch of the... Um, here are the uh, principles that we're going to touch on. Uh, there are many more than this, um, but this will give you a good um, baseline. Um, so JavaScript, as you guys all know, you're in it, is very powerful. Um, but with that power comes the responsibility of not only making applications that are functional and you know, really kick ass, but also that really takes care of the user, that gives a good user experience. There's no sense in having a really powerful application if it just pisses people off. All right, so let's jump in. So uh, principle number one, consistency. Consistency comes in a few different flavors. Uh, we're gonna talk about um, visual consistency. That's what everybody thinks of, I think, the aesthetics of it. Um, functional consistency, uh, the features, the functionality, the placement of those as well as external consistency, one that probably doesn't get as much attention as it needs, and that is like, how is your application consistent with everything else the user does uh, in the world? And there are times where that makes sense, and it's time, there are times where it's okay to, to bend those rules a little bit. So visual consistency. So uh, this is uh, an application, a client that came to Chariot Solutions. They had an application already. They were getting a lot of feedback. Uh, that the users weren't happy with it, uh, and they were having a lot of frustration in the app. The first thing that we did was um, do a, an audit, a UX assessment of the app. And among many other things, one of the things we found is that throughout the app, this is all in one app that's got like maybe five screens. We found all these different um, types of buttons or links or actions. Um, so some of the ways that they're inconsistent and have potential confusion are really obvious. Some of the buttons are full color, like blue and gray, and some are white. Some have icons, some don't. Um, to more subtle ways, like some of the buttons uh, have square corners, some of them are rounded corners, some of them are connected, some of them aren't. All those things add up throughout the, the use of the app to um, being hard to use. Uh, this one is more about sort of the functional consistency. And at first, this one's got a lot going on. Uh, this isn't one we worked on. Um, at first, you think like, OK, so there's, there's buttons in here. that are square. Um, there are ones that are rounded corner. But after further inspection and after getting into it, it's actually a pretty good use of consistency and using um, uh, shapes for separation of functionality. So, Anything that's sort of square, square corners, is actually a, a button. Um, whereas the things that are pill-shaped or rounded, those are things that are more like tags. So they're using that visual language. While you might not get it on a, a, a conscious level, um, it does throughout the app sort of help you um, understand the functionality of the different features. I know this wasn't, isn't a digital interface. I threw a couple of these uh, real world physical examples in here just because they're awesome metaphors um, for getting across these principles. Um, so this is a faucet. 
if, I, if we had the time and I could go around and ask every one of you um, how you think this faucet works, I th which we don't have time, unfortunately, I think the vast majority of you would probably say hot water on the left, cold water on the right. You'd be wrong, just like me. Um, the left is to turn the water hotter or colder, and the right is to turn the water stronger or less strong, the, the control the flow of the water. This is in another language, so a uh, quick Google search told me it's Bulgaria, I believe, um, which one might argue that in Bulgaria that's how all faucets work. However, the fact that they have to hang a sign up to tell you how to use this thing is a pretty good sign. Same thing in our digital interfaces. We want to avoid having to give instructions for people how to click a button, right? Anytime you have to do that, you're probably heading down the wrong road. All right. This is an exercise. I'm going to need all of you guys to join in and help me out with this one. So as I use this pointer to point to these color blocks, I want everybody in the audience to just shout out what color it is. You ready? Red. Or orange. Okay, awesome. I didn't hear everybody though, but this next one I know I'm going to hear everybody. So the next one is the same thing. I'm going to point to the colors on the screens. I need everybody to just shout out the color. Okay, you promise? You're all going to do it? Um, now it's a little bit different because on the next screen there are words, but the important thing is don't read the word, just shout out the color. Some of you guys have seen this before, it sounds like. Okay, you ready? Oh. Blue, gray. <laughs> Guys, all right, so that's fun. What's this, what this is teaching us though is that, that our, our brain works in, in weird ways. It's a lot easier for our human brains to, to read a word, to process it, than it is to suss out what the color is and then verbalize that, right? So it's a shortcut. So the implication that this has in our UIs is that, um, for instance, if you see a piece of text on a page that's blue and it has an underline, what does that mean? It's a link, right? So if you just like the color blue and you put blue text on your website but it's not a link, you're gonna confuse and frustrate users. So understanding how people understand and use um, the web in other places will help them um, help you provide the right user experience for them on your application. All right, so how do we put this principle into practice? Um, start with the design guide. Rough is better than none at all. So even if you just, as you create a new button type, create a screen grab of it, stick it in a Google Doc or something. It doesn't have to be pretty, doesn't have to be fancy. If you have the luxury of having designers on your team, um, obviously they probably have design guides already, I would hope. But if not, something is better than nothing and keeping it up to date. Another thing that's hugely useful for me is hang up every screen that you ever create side by side on a wall. You finish a screen, print it out, hang it on the wall. Seeing all the screens side by side next to each other is a great way You'll pick out inconsistencies and differences in the UI much more than you would um, just trying to look at it from screen to screen. All right, so next principle, hierarchy. Hierarchy is about helping your users um, understand what that screen is there to do for them. Um, this is a, a really good example of poor hierarchy, right? I mean, granted, this is an application, uh, an, an audio editing application or a video editing application, and there's a lot of features on here, right? There's no, nobody's arguing that, but um, helping the users, what are the three things that the user of this application does the most often? Is it snipping the video or the audio? Is it adjusting levels? Whatever the most prominent or the most um, used features are, somehow bring those to prominence and diminish the rest. Make them available, but make them diminished. The other thing is helping the user understand where they are, um, where the focus is, what they can do next, helping them navigate a screen. There's plenty of really egregious examples of poor usability out there on the web. I could do that all day, but I wanted to pick one that was more 
um, more realistic. You know, this one is not nearly as bad as the last one you saw, but there's a lot going on here. So this website is clearly about uh, something. Um, it, you know, it begs the question, like, what, what does the owner of this website want me to see? What do they, what's the most important thing for me to get to? What are the, what are the priorities for me to do here? Um, they did a redesign of this website, same website, um, much better. So it's very clear here now that this is Edinburgh University Press. You know, their number one thing to convey is that they are publishing in partnership, right? Learn more about our full publishing service for societies. So now I know who they are, what they do, and the books, journals about us, those are sort of those secondary things um, that presumably they did some user research and found out that these are the top three things or four things that users are coming to their website. Or from a business, these are their business priorities. This is what they want to convey or steer people towards on their website. All right, so hierarchy. How do we put this principle into practice? You know, before starting a new project or a new screen or uh, feature for your project, list out all the objectives that a user might need to accomplish. You're probably all very familiar with doing uh, use cases, but just make sure those use cases are written from a very human point of view. What is it that they want to get done? Now, likely you're going to have a long list, so highlight what the, pri the number one most priority thing is on that list, and then a couple of secondaries. Um, and then check in as you're developing, check in every once in a while uh, to make sure that you're meeting those. Accessibility. There's a lot that goes into accessibility. We're gonna to touch on just a few of them here. Um, colors and contrast, um, focus action states of uh, action items, alt text on images, et cetera. Um, so this is a common one. Um, don't use color alone to signify the state of something. So in this case, as you can see on the left-hand side, they're using green to say, hey, okay, you know, it passes, it's valid, and red to say there's an error of some sort. The problem is for, for colorblind people, you know, seven, eight percent of Americans, some 10 million people, I think you're gonna want to help them out. So here, uh, they've added little icons to the left, um, so they're still using color, but they're not relying on color alone. Um, I might have even gone a step further and, you know, maybe you don't even need the green check marks. Maybe that would help the, the red X's stick out a bit more. But this is a good start. Amazon. Amazon has no excuse. They have thousands and thousands of developers. They should be able to get this right. But it's amazing. Um, the vast majority of images on Amazon don't have an alt tag. So anybody that needs assistive, like screen readers, or even um, folks in uh, very low bandwidth places, uh, I haven't looked at the statistics lately, but it's still pretty high, the amount of people that surf the web with images turned off. Um, they're gonna be out of luck with a lot of the Amazon website. Show of hands, who's heard of Stack Overflow? Right, I, I was at a, I was at a um, conference recently and um, Joel, Spolsky, I think his name is, the co-founder or the founder of Stack Overflow was talking about the analytics. He said there's something like, um, I forget what it is, but they have more unique visits per month than there are developers in the world. So Stack Overflow is doing okay. So they have no excuse either. I'm sure they have plenty of designers, yet somehow a lot of their website fails on um, color contrast, right? And this is just the home page and just the first five things, four or five things I found. Um, all these things here are, the text is either too small or the color is not dark enough on the background or not light enough on a dark background. In a slide or two, I think I have a link um, to, there are a lot of uh, resources out there on the web where you can plug in the numbers, you can check your contrast, there's a best practice uh, ratio that you should try to meet. This is just a really good example. You know, this might be a really entertaining soccer game, you know, unless you're colorblind. 
So how do we put these principles into practice? Um, review against a checklist. So I have a link here, accessibility.voxmedia.com, and these presentations will be up afterwards so you can get those links. Um, but that's got a good checklist. It's got one in there for designers. It's got one specific to engineers. It's got like product manager. And there are plenty of other good resources out there. Do it right the first time. So learn what these best practices are and do it from the start because I promise you, fix it in post-production never happens. A, you're moving on to other cool new features. Uh, and B, it's just a lot harder to retrofit good accessibility onto something that's been uh, developed already. And accessibility is everybody's job. It's not the designer's job or the product job or developer's job, it's everybody's job. Negative space. So a lot of times this is equated with, you know, designers being designers, they need their things to look pretty and there's definitely some truth to that. We designers love our negative space, but there's also a, a lot of science to back up why this is good practice in a lot of ways. Increased content legibility, right? It doesn't matter how much stuff you pack into the screen. If it's not usable, it's not usable. Then it was all for nothing. Uh, calling attention. So you have a quote or a piece of information or possibly a button, some sort of a call to action that you want to highlight. Put lots of room around it and I guarantee people's eyeballs are going to go there first. A lot of times we think of white space, we think of big swaths of white space, um, but it can be used in, in little bits too. So this is the same information here, um, just organized a little bit differently. So the fact that we're using a little bit of white space here and white space here, it adds balance to it, but it also um, helps, helps you focus on what to read first. Um, and also if we had multiple of these lined up on a page like blog posts, abstracts usually are, it helps you skim them. It helps you jump from one headline to the next headline. Ouch. Honestly, I could have used Ling's cars for every single one of these principles. He somehow managed to break every single one of them and probably made up some new ones to break. But, you know, obviously you can see here that there's, there's no place for your eyeball to rest. Everything runs into everything. Everything is screaming for attention. All right, so how do we put this principle into practice? Number one thing is you just gotta get comfortable with white space. Open does not equal wasted. Uh, if it helps, go to um, sites or pieces of software that you admire, that you think are good, and then look at how they use white space. You know, uh, one of the ones that comes to mind for me is like Android. If you remember, not that many years ago, maybe even five years ago, if you go to Android or some of the Android phone manufacturers' websites, they would pack a lot of stuff in there. That, that designery, fluffy white space stuff was like for Apple. But if you go there nowadays, you're gonna see uh, that there's a lot of white space in every sort of screen area as you're scrolling through the page. There's usually gonna be like one main uh, thing to focus on, a lot of white space driving your eyeball to the right place. So look at the places that you admire and see how they use it. And understand that everybody scrolls. A lot of times the argument that I'll hear about lack of white space is we need to cram a lot of stuff above the fold, which is what's visible in your browser when you first um, load a application or a website. Um, and if you go to abovethefold.fyi, you'll see tons of articles where that's been debunked. People do not mind scrolling, especially in the mobile world we are in now. A flick of a thumb is so much easier than trying to like zoom into a piece and pan around and, and, and read through the content or make your way through the content there. Grouping and alignment. All right, so I cheated. I put two under this one, but they're, they're, uh, they go hand in hand. Forms is a good place. A lot of you have probably heard of uh, Luke W. He did a great write-up a couple of years ago about forms in particular. Um, so the, the alignment of the labels over the field here to the left of the field, but right aligned here, and to the left of the fields, but left aligned here. Um, there's, there, there turns out there's pros and cons to doing each one. You just have to decide what is the best for your users. I find uh, out of these three, 
This one is typically the best. Um, it, it puts the labels close to the field so that it's easy to scan and move down uh, the screen and get everything filled out. This is one that, that we at Cherry have done recently for a client. Um, we went with the material design uh, pattern where the labels are inside the field and when you put focus on the field, they zoom up to the left so they're always there. It's very scannable, it's very movable. Not always possible, but when you can, that's a really good option. Um, it's amazing what a little bit of thing like alignment in a, in a spreadsheet or in table data uh, will do for you. On the left here, the things that are center aligned, very hard to scan. Um, dollar amounts, especially when you have um, sense, you know, the, the decimal point, uh, it's, really it's really helpful to have it right aligned to help scan it. Um, but yeah, for scannability and findability, alignment makes a big difference. Uh, so for this one, the, you know, at first glance, the, the layout of this, the, the use of white space, all of it, it doesn't look horrible, and it's not bad. Um, but when you see it next to the updated version, um, you can see that all the, they put the uh, label value pair side by side so it's easy to scan. They left aligned all the labels. Now you may notice they probably don't pass color contrast here. It's always, uh, it's always trade-offs. Um, but you can easily scan the labels and then pop over and see the value. It's much easier than trying to parse through here. So there's always room for improvement. All right, another exercise. I see that everybody's got pencil and paper, so no excuses here. So if everybody could grab one of those uh, pens and paper, uh, I am going to read out some numbers. So now that everybody has your pencil and paper, please put them down, all right? And don't pick them back up until I instruct you to. I'm gonna read out uh, some numbers, and then I'm gonna wait a second or two, and then I'm gonna tell you to write down as many of those digits as you can remember. So it's important, don't start writing until I tell you it's okay. Everybody ready? One, two, zero, one, five, 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 eight, nine, three, two, okay, hold, please. Everybody ready and go. Write down as many digits as you can remember. Okay, who got, who thinks they got, say, four digits? Five? Six? Seven? Eight? Nine? Okay, good, there, there weren't nine digits. If anybody was still holding their hand up, I caught ya. All right, I'm gonna do the exact same thing except I'm gonna chunk those digits into a phone number. Okay, everybody, so pens down. One, 201, 555, 8932. And write. All right, show of hands, who thinks they got the whole entire phone number? Okay, many, many more. All right, so the, the, the implication in our UI design here is that the same information chunked or grouped in different ways can have a vast difference on how people are able to remember it, how they're able to process it, how they keep it in their short-term working memory so that they can be more efficient in whatever it is they're doing in your app. It makes a difference, so be conscious of that. So how we put it, uh, the grouping into practice is that um, we just review the UI often and just be conscious of how the elements are grouped. Just, just think about that. Um, make sure you're using enough margin, padding, space between elements. Um, and use center alignment sparingly. Center alignment is, a, is, is, is pretty bad unless you've got, unless it's supposed to be sort of the centerpiece or the focal piece and you have a very um, limited UI. All right, we're running short on time. I'm gonna speed up my pace here. Error treatment. I'm just gonna let you read some of these. These are, these are pretty funny. Uh, user error, it's not our fault. Something happened, something happened. Press any key to continue or any other key to quit. And my favorite, you know, being the UX guy, user error, replace user. I had many more screens of these, but I think you guys get the point. All right, so 
less funny, but still is uh, potentially confusing. These ones on the left here, um, something wasn't right, form submission failed. Let's, let's pick the keywords out of here. Um, errors, uh, failed, problem, invalid. You know, there's, there's sort of an undercurrent here. This is basically saying our application sucks or you, the user, sucks. Neither of those is a good message to send and there's nothing helpful here. The ones on the right are slightly better. There's a little bit of information in there. The printer installation failed, um, error, OX, blah, 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 blah. Not super helpful for me, but if I call customer support, at least I can give them that. It gives me a little bit of something. Um, the application failed to start because it could not load the blah, blah, blah plugin. Again, I may not know what that means, but at least it starts me down a path. So that's a little bit better. Um, much better is can't rename pictures because the file folder or name already exists, specify a different name. So that tells me what the problem is and it tells me what I can do to fix it. Um, the password you entered is incorrect, lost your password. Again, told me what's wrong, told me how to fix it. Even better than this though would be don't let the user make a mistake. If it's at all possible for us to prevent that mistake from happening, let's do it. This first one up here, cancel reservation. Are you sure you want to cancel this reservation? Uh, but then the word cancel is actually going to cancel the canceling. So they were on the right track. They're going to keep the people from making the mistake, but that was not a good implementation. This one on this side, it's much better. Um, your changes will be lost. Are you sure you want to leave the page? It's always helpful to put the text here or even the headline, leave the page with the affirmative action, the leave the page, what you want to do. Uh, templating, you know, only letting them enter digits and only letting them enter the right amount uh, is always helpful. They can't make a mistake here. And then autofill um, helps keep them from, from making typographic mistakes, typos. All right, so do an error audit. And again, start from the best. Can this be prevented? Can we stop them from making an error? If, if that's not possible, can they reverse out of the error? And if that's not possible, then we need to at least give them all the information and how to fix or avoid the error. One really good way to do this is set up an email to yourself that anytime an error happens at all ever in your application, you get an email. Because if you start getting a lot of emails, you're going to want to go in there and fix that. All right. The spa day prototype. So really quickly, um, I'm going to go through the prototype that we, as a team, created for um, today's presentation. So it's a sample application about a spa. Nyuk, nyuk. Um, it's designed specifically for this conference. This, the, all the speakers together um, got together and designed this. Um, I put together these UI screens for it. Um, so throughout the talks, you'll, you may see or have reference to or see the code behind um, the multiple versions. Uh, each of the speakers produce their version using the, their language or platform uh, that they'll be presenting on. Um, so they'll all share their experiences with it. Uh, and the idea for creating this application is just so that we're sort of comparing apples to apples. We have one common application that everybody um, worked on their version of. Uh, so this is the home screen. We're just giving a little bit of information about what the spa is all about. And over, over here, you can choose your appointment time. You can view the appointment times. You can choose the appointment time. The chat feature we'll see in just a second. This is a clickable prototype, so I will click here. Um, I've chosen an appointment time, so I just have to fill out the following information. We wanted to have a few different field types um, covered here. So we've got text field, radios, and drop down. So I choose my treatment type and register. I've got a confirmation screen that's got a success message, my appointment details, and a complete registrant list. A little creepy maybe, but it served the purpose of what we were trying to do, so. Um, and then a chat feature is just, it's an overlay of whatever screen you're on. Um, simple chat feature. And I think that just about covers all the, the features of the, the demo app. So there's just a handful of um, user experience principles to consider. Um, 
I'm sure all you guys are uh, very familiar with the concept of technical debt. Um, hopefully you'll consider experienced debt moving forward. The more things that you can get right just by understanding these principles and doing little things along the way, the less experienced debt there is when you're finished and the less work there will be, less frustration for your users and the less work there will be updating it to a better user experience, you know, once you get it out there. That's it for me, thank you.